Good morning. Good morning, sir. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer, asking God to open up our eyes and our hearts and our ears to receive the words of our Savior. A wonderful promise, a wonderful invitation that he gives to us in the times in which we live. A lot of noise, a lot of commotion, a lot of unrest, a lot of distress. And our Savior offers to us himself, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Father, help us today as we hear these words and as we expose them in the form of a sermon. We do pray that the Holy Spirit would be the one that is the speaker, he is the preacher, and that also that same spirit would uh, be in present and working and renewing our minds, helping us to hear these words. Help us, Father, to embrace the offer that Jesus gives to us and that he laid down his own life so that it would be possible that we could enjoy this kind of sweet fellowship and relationship and a discipleship with him. So guide us today. We pray, we beseech thee in Jesus' name. Amen. So in our passage, it is one that, to give it its context, it takes us back in the time when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and every once in a while there were more than just his disciples. So more than likely, as he's making this pronouncement and giving this invitation, uh, you have more than just the 12, probably somewhat of a crowd. We don't know how many, but I would visualize it this way as he's speaking to the congregation of uh, those in the field. He comes to this, t this, this section of his speaking, and he looks about and he sees a people that are just weighed down with the high expectations of the Pharisees. And so in that sense, they were weary and they had heavy burdens to carry. And he makes a statement that if they would learn of him, he, he would offer to them uh, a, still a yoke and there would still be a burden but it is not going to be the yoke and the bondage and the burden of the Pharisees that had basically added to the law of Moses. And so that as people tried to live that way and own up to those expectations, the, a lot of minutia, a lot of small points of the law that were expanded and broken down into whether you could carry a fork on the Sabbath day and, and those kind of matters. This became burden to those that really wanted to be obedient to the Lord. And so Jesus says, here's the way it is. Come unto me, all of you that are attempting to live this life under the hardship of man-made laws, rules, and regulations. And I will give you rest. However, you have to learn of me. And so in that, in this learning, he offers then there is still... Uh, a process, there are still things to be observed, but yet the learning brings rest. The doing did not bring rest, and that is the contrast. Now, we want to draw from that. Uh, I give you the context so that we understand that when I give a, an application, which we'll be doing here today, there are a lot of parallels. There are a lot of parallels that we'll look at as we get into this. But the main thing is the, the, the love of Jesus Christ where he offers and he invites and he knows hearts, he knows struggles, he knows what people are going through and he, and he extends it out there to all of us, even in the 21st century, all the world, but mainly the church. He says, I have what you need. I have rest. And I notice when I look out, I see that you have noise. You have issues. You have a noisy heart, a noisy soul. There's a restlessness there. 
and I have the answer. And it, it, he would say, it is in myself. It is in the person of Jesus Christ. It's very important for us to, to capture that. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. And for I am lowly in heart, meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Three observations from this this morning. The first is going to be the fact that Jesus invites us to come to him. Secondly, we will observe that Jesus seeks those with restless hearts or restless souls. You might add in there, uh, because we'll get to this, noisy, restless hearts and souls. And then Jesus is the remedy. And that's the part that takes a little bit more thought. Uh, that's the part that actually, part three of a sermon is not going to really do it justice. But what it does do, it gives us a, a new direction. It will give us the, the food, it'll give us what we need to be able to pursue a direction through Jesus Christ that will bring about rest. So this sermon has a lot to do with the invitation itself and Jesus, uh, he, he seeks those that are struggling and then the presentation is as of himself to be able to answer to those heartfelt needs and the struggles that we face in life. When we look at this, Jesus invites us to return onto him. It's you, you, you got to look at it this way. His invitation is not necessarily a general invitation. By nature of the weary and heavy burden, he's being specific. He's looking for people and he's inviting people that really are struggling in life. And it's not that the others do not matter, but you know yourself when you're listening to, a, let's say, a, a, an ad or you're reading something in the paper that advertises maybe a, a medicine or a product. And uh, as a general reader, you would say, that's nice. That's going to be very helpful. That medicine or supplement can be very useful. But you don't need it right now. You're doing all right. But it's not as if you're going to disregard the whole thing. But on the other hand, if it speaks to something that affects your body and is going to bring about improvement, you're going to get pay attention to it. And so the promoters are targeting the group that has the need, but at the same time giving out the invitation to all that, that here it is. This is what Jesus is doing. And so he's, he sees weariness. He sees those that are carrying tremendous amount of burdens. And in this then, he, he looks... To, and he sees people that are overwhelmed uh, by the, the, the failures of their own strategies. We all have strategies. We all have ideas. We all have a game plan on how we're going to manage life. And in the end, they prove to be very weary and uh, we become tired. It's kind of like palm trees in a hurricane. They, they take the wind. They take the beating. And when it's all said and done, you can still see the effect of all that wind upon the palm trees. And even regular trees, the leaves are kind of like turned in a different direction. The light from the sky reflects differently because we're looking more at the bottom of the leaf than we are at the top. And so when Jesus looks, he sees wind-torn hearts. He sees restless souls. He sees people that are pressed down by uh, a self-dependence. And that's what brings about the need for the rest. We have to acknowledge that life is not always going to be easy. We also have to acknowledge that there are two wisdoms in the world, the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men. The wisdom of men will always bring about failure and futility. An exercise is kind of like uh, trying to climb a muddy, slippery slope and you get nowhere fast, but you put a lot of effort into it. And that is what it is like to live in the wisdom of this world. And so he uses those two terms. The invitation to people that are, that are struggling, that are beaten down, and like the load on a cargo ship, the only difference is this ship is nearly sinking. If we were to draw it structurally, you could just have two pillars and a beam, and the heavy laden would be where the beam is beginning to sag because of the weight of the cargo. So we have to begin with our, having our minds being renewed by what is true about God and what is false about our own strategies and our own way of doing things. 
You see, when we think about what is true, we have to believe we know and we, we have a statement that says God can be trusted. And the focus has to be put on the fact that we can depend upon him. We would also recognize that the truth about God, when we talk about having renewed minds, is that he has oftentimes larger plans than, than what we are living in. The scope of our plans is typically narrow. The scope of God's plans are universal. And it affects things and situations and people that we don't even know about today. Thirdly, he has an infinite wisdom. There is a wisdom that God has that is true about God, that God calls us to trust and believe and faith, accept and acknowledge that he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is a helper in a time of need. So when we make that statement, we begin by having our minds being renewed by what is true about God. Jesus offers that invitation and he says, I, I am the truth, I am the life, you can trust me, I will give you rest. That is not a false promise, that is not a placebo, that is not something that is just rhetoric. You can have a genuine rest that Jesus himself enjoyed. And I think that's the part we have to capture. He's inviting us to come into the same kind of rest that he enjoyed with his father. Jesus had had a he had days that were just as bad, if not worse, than ours. He just didn't have the Florida Turnpike. He didn't have the IRS. He had Caesar. But when we look at Jesus' life, we don't see Jesus becoming frustrated with, uh, now where did that disciple go? Doesn't he know he's supposed to be here? And, and just having a heartache and a headache over so many different, uh, uh, you know, failures in life. He submitted everything to the Father's will. He took it in stride because he kept his heart focused and gazing upon the will of his Father. And he accepted those things that were coming into him. And he knew that his Father would not make a mistake. He knew that he was on the right path. He was doing at the will of his Father, which he said several times to his disciples. Look at Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3, the ones that we read this morning. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined onto me and heard my cry. I highlighted and bold printed the words that speak of God. He inclined onto David. He heard David's cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit. And the Hebrew there gives us the opportunity to say a noisy pit. Not just out of the mud and the clay, but maybe the noise of warfare, the, the noise of fear. And he set my feet upon a rock, established my goings. He put a new song in my heart and even praise unto God. Many shall see it in fear, many shall trust in the Lord. The end result. This is just a lovely passage because what it does, it speaks of God's active involvement in the life of his saints. He's not just a listener. He's not just one that gives the invitation, but he gives the invitation with the intent of doing something that will bring stability and a whole change of mind, a whole change of attitude. And so instead of singing songs of sorrow and grief like uh, the Jews would do while they were in Babylon, they were going to be singing songs of praise and worship. So much so that the voice of it and the words of those hymns would cause people to trust. This is the kind of renewal of the mind that Jesus gives. This is the kind of thinking that he can bring to us, which brings us then to this, that God desires to hear what we have on our hearts. He desires to hear our prayers. We would also observe that he gives stability. And so that in those days when a life is like walking on a big wet sponge and there's nothing stable about it, he brings the stability upon a rock. And then thirdly, he would give to us a new song. Now that is characteristic of God. That is characteristic of Jesus. And it's all wrapped up in this invitation. Come unto me. Those first four words, come unto me. All you that are. So that's his plea. That's his invitation. And he wants to be able to answer us today as he did at David's day. So he seeks those that have restless souls. He qualifies the invitation to the, to the weary 
and the, the overloaded, the burden down. What makes for burden? What makes for weariness? The stuff we are very familiar with, the noise. It's not the noise that is on the commercials on the TV where the DB level amps up probably about 10 to 12 higher and you got to turn the volume down. It's not the noise of the streets or the traffic or the horns or the sirens. It's not the noise of an engine going bad. It's the noise of thoughts. The noise of thoughts can be so prevailing, so overwhelming, that they become the noisemakers. And that's all we hear. Now, by that, I do not, there's, I think we need to give it some kind of an explanation as by what is meant by that. There are some kinds of noise that, you know, that's, that's just life. So when you're driving up the turnpike and uh, you're, you're running a little bit late, there, there will be, oh, how am I going to get there in time? And we finally make it. We got idiots out there that pass and cut you off and all kinds of things and just makes for good conversation. But if on the way up, the state trooper pulls you over and you receive a $150 fine for speeding through a work zone, because even if everybody else was, you hold that ticket. That does not mean to get to go a ball game. It means that you either appear in court, you just write a check. Where am I going to get that money? And if it all happens during a time in your life when the budget is already tight, that can become noise. That can become something that you just run it through your mind. I'm going to have to uh, not pay this or have to balance this or somehow or another, there is the anxiety of how to meet that unexpected expense. It could be the failure of your vehicle. It could be the failure of your health. It could be uh, just in a sense that there's so much going on and we're constantly trying to arrange and rearrange that there's no more rest in Jesus. It's a struggle in Jesus. And so that's what we mean by noise, the thoughts. Thoughts are noisemakers. And the noise in the heart, the noise of that, all those thoughts can be so deafening that we can no longer hear the voice of God. We used to, well, my wife's from Dayton, Ohio, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And in the day when we lived in, in that area and I was stationed at the air base, uh, the, the B-52s, they just seemed to run 24 hours a day, up and down, up and down, up and down. And you had the opportunity to go to the under, at the end of the runway, either where they were coming in or where they were taking off, and be able to observe those big bad boys. It was just nice. But that's all you could do because you could not hear the other person speak. You could not hear yourself think. It was an overwhelming noise of, of jet engines. It's like yesterday, uh, the jets were doing touch and goes over at the air base. And if you were anywhere near that area, you would not be able to hear the person stepping across from you because of the noise. That is the kind of noise that oftentimes our thoughts create such a volume that we no longer can hear the voice of Jesus as he's, you maybe see his lips moving, but you cannot hear it. You cannot hear the words. You cannot hear the word of God. You cannot hear the voice of God. And so he says to those that are in those kind of conditions, he seeks those. Let me give you some example of noisemakers. And this is a partial list. It varies with every individual. And so it doesn't mean it's a stock and trade list. That's all there is. You can have anxiety and fear. To an extent, we all struggle with that. Discouragement, despair. There can be frustration. Depending on your expectations, it's going to decide how much frustration you have. And even in our uh, frustrations, that's going to be decided whether or not we recognize providence, sovereignty of God that he manages all events, sinfulness, response of people, anger, bitterness. You speak of bitterness, it was St. Augustine that said this, resentment and bitterness that a person holds on to is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. And that could be a lot of noise. That could be a, a deep struggle of the heart. Noise, guilt, and shame is another one. For the last Sunday in the chapel service this week, I made mention that when we talk about guilt in the, of the conscience installed by God becomes an individual's best friend. It's kind of like going to the doctor and they do all of that blood work 
and they bring you three or four pages of all that data that you can't read, but inside of it there was very important information. And so it was necessary to extract some of your blood so that they could observe and see where are some threatening areas. The conscience and its guilt is that. It points the finger at the very crux of human life in relationship to God. And so guilt becomes man's best friend. It's the warning system. It's there telling him that your heart is not right. Entertainment can be an obsession. And it can be the, the, all of the noise and gaming and, and uh, so much more in the electronic cyber world. People can be just obsessed with greed, never satisfied, discontentment, all the things. Sorrow can be there. And the, some of these things are, are natural responses. The Bible speaks to each one of those issues. It's when we fail to come to grips with where our heart is and whether or not that is our practice is where the noise persists. And Jesus looks out and he says, the restless soul, the restless hearts, come on to me. I have what you need. I will give you the rest that you need. All that have noisemakers in your soul, you have no rest. Come unto me. Life is not supposed to work with God at the center. Life is not supposed to work without God at the center. You need to write that down in the fly leaf of your Bible because that's going to determine where you go next. God has never intended for life to work without Him at the center. All things are broke that are not on the right compass. So this is very critical because we have a way of substituting center with philosophies and different worldviews or different ideas or traditions. It doesn't matter what it is. If God is not at the center, life is not going to work, and it's meant to be that way. That means when, when people struggle and there's a lot of noise, it's meant to be that way because God is not center. He is not the, the point where all things begin and all things end. Where our thinking starts, he is not at that point where all that we look at in life and how we manage the situations of life go through that biblical grid. What does the Bible have to say? What does God's Word have to say? What does Jesus say on the issue? Life is not supposed to work that way. So we moved as to Jesus' plea to the third point. Jesus is the remedy for our restless souls. We want, we want remedies. And the, the medical field will provide you. I just received my Medicare 2020 book of some 1,000 medications that Medicare will cover. I'm not so much concerned about the Medicare covering part. It's the 1,000. Do you realize how many different varieties are out there that seem to indicate the different ailments or problems that the human body has? Let's just go dig a grave and climb into it because something, your odds are a thousand to one that you're going to get something and we got the medicine to fix you because we are a solution-oriented society. We want things fixed. And to, to uh, hammer on the medical field, they do, they do well, they serve the public well, but that they do that in such a way to make people think that there is no other way and there are other options. We come to the spiritual life we are people, basically, that we, we want something to be fixed. We don't, are not really interested in how to go through the journey. We're not really interested. At least it's not our first thought as to what is it that God is doing in an infinite wisdom and His providential care and construction of my life to be like Jesus Christ. You see, that is not a solution. That is a path. That is discipleship. That is God at the center. It's a different way of thinking and seeing life. It's from that perspective. And the only way that we're going to do that is we listen to Jesus' words, learn of me. And Peter echoes that language in this text. Grace and peace be multiplied on you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Peace multiplied so peace stands in opposition to restlessness and noise, multiplied through the knowledge, the understanding, the fellowship, the discipleship, 
It's not an academic knowledge. Anybody in this room could tell me many things about Jesus. We could share all that. But can we seriously and honestly explain what it's like to think like Jesus, to live like Jesus? You see, that's the knowledge that he wants us to, to impart onto us. Not the textbook, but the author. He wants our hearts to live and walk with, it's Jesus and be doing things together. That kind of knowledge. So a profile of an individual will give us their name, date, birth date, uh, and a place of residence, a phone number, blood type, and race, creed, religion, and all those kinds of things. That is general information, that is knowledge about that individual. It's very academic. It's very structured. But a, there's another level of profile, and it's a profile that your spouse knows of you. It's a profile that your closest friend knows about you, how you think, what your attitude is, what your response is going to be. And it's, the, and it's only found through relationship. It's only found through and recognized and identified through a communication, one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, there's a tightness there, there's a unity. And that's how we learn of each other. So we can have friends that we visit, speak with them a couple, oh, I see you at the restaurant the other day, and stop and say hello and those kind of things. That is a friendship that is somewhat distant compared to the friends that you might meet that you've not seen for years and you were close friends and you lived in the same neighborhood and your kids grew up together and you would trust your entire family with their family, etc. That's a different level of friendship. That's where Jesus wants to take us. And when it comes to learn of me. So he is the remedy. And in part we have to understand we've got to come to Jesus and purpose to be like him to quiet the noise in our soul. If there's not that intention to intentionally, purposefully to be like, to learn of him, to be like him. These are his virtues and those virtues that he gives to us are that of meekness and lowliness. You have to understand, we're always learning something. Life is not in a vacuum. We're constantly pulling down and gaining information. Then we would say that we take information and it holds certain uh, subject headings and certain titles and certain topics. Information may be about uh, you know, politics, information about the Bible, information about the neighborhood, that kind of information. Then there's information and knowledge that we learn on management, what to do, when to do, how to do, and information on friends. And this, this world, this information highway, this learning process only has one of two sources. There is the the, the census, the consensus, and the, and the knowledge that the world offers, and then there is the knowledge that God gives to us. So there's a continual learning process. It's what are we going to focus on? We always believe in someone. Non-belief is non-existent. So you can either believe in your own ways, or in the wisdom of this world, or you're going to believe in God and His ways, his invitation in his son in the word of God. Non-belief is non-existent. We, we, we just cannot believe in anything. You are either lean heavily upon your own ways, your own understanding, or we will lean heavily, as Proverbs 3 points out, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. If we lean heavily in our own ways, we are going to direct our own steps if we lean upon the Lord and his understanding he will direct our steps. So Jesus' invitation calls us from a broken thinking, broken system, broken strategies and ideas to that of his character. His character is meekness and lowliness. Come unto me, all ye that are, la are uh, weary and heavy laden, and I will do what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. Those two words define the simplicity of Jesus' offer. Learn of me in these two categories, which at some other time we can flesh this out, 
But I just want you to see there's, there's kind of like a, a, a paradox here. And that is this, that here is this, we have these massive struggles, these big issues, and their weight, they beat us down. It's a lot of load. Here comes this simple man, if you will. The two things that are contradictory to accomplishing anything in human wisdom, meek and lowly. It's meekness is weakness and lowliness is you're, not, you're afraid to stand up or anything or just letting somebody run all over you. And so there's the paradox. Typically, we, we think something bigger, better, stronger, some, the execution of some new philosophy and new worldview, some new idea is going to solve the, the tensions and the problems that we deal with. But yet Jesus says, meek and lowly. A willingness to be governed in a humble attitude. In and found in him. Learned from him. How does he manage that? When you look at his life, it was, it was a continuance of that, that meekness and a lowliness. And then as we would sing in the uh, hymn this morning, who could imagine that the Lamb would take away the sins of the world? That's not even what the Jews expected. The Jews expected a hero, the white horse, the king coming in, the conqueror. And Jesus says, not, not that way. I am meek and lowly. Learn of me. Learn of me. The way to satisfying rest is in the person and in the relationship with that person is to learn and acquire and live out those virtues, those qualities of his life. That's going to be in collision with uh, the noise of the heart, the noise of the soul. But yet that is where Jesus wants to take us. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's not saying that it's a do-nothing world. Learning of Jesus is not learning a set of laws or a set of principles. It's learning to think and see the world through his eyes. That's learning. That's the, that, that is central to the life of Jesus. How did he interpret situations? How did he deal with the frustration that the Pharisees and constantly being false accused and set up and with trick questions? How did he deal with the, the failure of the disciples or the, the wrong attitude of the people that wanted a king. They, did, they didn't want this uh, miracle worker and this son of God. They wanted somebody in armor. How did he manage that? He managed that because he interpreted life and he saw things through the, the eyes of God, his father, and the big picture. And so that is how, in his meekness, he was willing to be governed by God's sovereignty and God's providence. And not all of it would make sense. At least it doesn't to us when we look at it. We know the rest of the story, but not everything makes sense in our own lives. The paradox is that a life with God at the center is, is uh, with God at the center is rest and not a heavy burden. You see, when God is at the center, when we learn of Jesus, that is rest. He offers that to us. But I would venture to say that sometimes, you know, we get into the idea of what is discipleship. And disciples are, so, are, are supposed to be, you know, we, we have our peace and we have our joy and we have our struggles. That is true. But a life lived with God at the center is rest and not a heavy burden. Sometimes we misinterpret discipleship as being a very heavy load, a whole ton of do's and don'ts and what I can do and what I cannot do. Discipleship was never meant to be a heavy burden. It was never meant to be weary. Following Jesus, fellowship with him, the invitation to come to his rest is it's simply he's offering his mind, his heart, his teaching as the, the remedy to a failed system. And so when he does that, he's saying, listen, if in our Christian life, if we're struggling and there's this restless, noisy heart that lacks the rest and confidence that we need, 
then it's time to go back and learn of Jesus. That's what it's telling us. If it is true that Jesus says, come unto me, you that labor, so come unto me is the invitation for fellowship, and our heavy burden, learn of me, is the invitation for discipleship. And so if in that learning of Jesus and following him in meekness and lowliness turns out to be more restlessness, somewhere along the line, we misunderstand what it is to be a true follower and a learner of Jesus Christ. Something is amiss. So in the Christian life, you're saying, you're, preacher, you're, you're speaking of something that is it's like trying to bring Saturn into our backyard. It does seem to be way out there, doesn't it? I will agree with you. And then when I float on a piece of wood with the Apostle Paul, and he writes about being shipwrecked and beaten with rods 30 or 40 times and, and uh, being under sickness and being in prison and everything, and he says, but these light afflictions are light compared to the glory, the eternal weight of glory that is found in heavens and reserved for us. Isn't that something? That seems so far-fetched, but yet it is an absolute reality. And so discipleship and having, finding rest in Jesus, that fellowship that we can enjoy from him as he extends the invitation is the true reality of life that is not fake. It is what Jesus wants us to have. He didn't say these words so that we could someday wish we would get there. He gave us that promise so that on this day we could be there. So here's the invitation. If my heart and my soul are restless and noisy, then it is necessary that I learn of Jesus. So he's come to me in purpose to be like him. If that's what is needed to quiet the noise. Let's exchange our weariness and our load, our heavy burden for the virtues of Jesus Christ. It's an exchange. As we exchanged our sin for his righteousness by faith, here we can exchange our weariness and our heavy burdens and our broken ideas for his wisdom, his meekness, and his lowliness. And he will give us rest. Father, I pray that today as we leave this auditorium, we would leave with the intent and the purpose of being able to receive that precious rest that we all sometimes need, some more than others at different times. There are people that are not even here today, Lord, that, uh, that might even be in different churches, that there's just so much noise that takes place. And Father, forgive us for, for pursuing uh, wrong ways and, and faulty ideas. Most important would be that the rest of the soul that an individual can have would be to have his guilt relieved and replaced with a pure conscience through righteousness of Jesus Christ, that of salvation, where there can be the, the rest of an eternal rest in Christ, the, the rest from trying to work our way to know and to uh, get to heaven and that it be found the one that already paid the price that, that can have that kind of peace and quietness in the peace of God and a peace with God. That soul, Lord, we pray that you would speak to them by way of being saved here on this day also. We ask these things as we sing our hymn of invitation that you would still speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.